So Noel James is a uh, is studying a master's in spacecraft design at the Lulea University of uh, Technology, where he is part of a group of students hoping to participate in the Rexus Vexus program from ESA. Uh, he did his bachelor in astrophysics in the University of Glasgow, and his honor project focused on constructing a low noise shadow position sensor using a laser with the project acting as a feasibility study for improvements to the position sensors used in LIGO. He participated in the ESA Summer of Code in 2019 uh, with the SACNOTS network, uh, investigating feasibility of using Doppler sheet measurements and the ORCID spaceflight dynamics library to carry orbit determination. So, um as uh, Juan just told you, I did my bachelor's in astrophysics at the University of Glasgow, and I'm currently doing a master's in spacecraft design up in Kirana, which is in the Arctic Circle. So it's a bit of a weather change, seeing as it's about minus six there and snowing currently. Um, but this summer I participated in the uh, ESA Summer of Code and Space program, which uh, with a project that focused on determining the feasibility of uh, using ORCID and a Doppler curves provided by the SATNOGS network to carry out accurate uh, orbit determinations. So, SATNOGS network is a global network of open source ground, source, ground, uh, open source ground stations, which, due to the way the specifications are done up, can be um, constructed fairly cheaply at home for only a couple hundred euros each. Um, and the network allows all users to use any available net station in the network to track and monitor a satellite or to communicate with it. Um, and then, so with all observational data then up uploaded to the SATNOX network's website. Uh, unfortunately, currently it's not possible to extract uh, Doppler curves directly from the SATNOX network. But um, fortunately for us, the uh, CISBASA, who is presenting tomorrow, I believe, had uh, modified his own, sat his own satellite station to be able to extract Doppler curves directly, which he kindly shared with us. So for this project, we used data from the Max Valier satellite, which was an amateur satellite constructed in collaboration between the Max Valier High School in Südtirol and OHB Germany and the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Research. Uh, the main payload is an X-ray telescope to image the Earth, but interestingly for us, it uh, also contains a uh, continuous wave beacon, which transmits a message, which allows us to lock on to it. Um, it orbits with an apogee of 490 kilometers and a perigee of 508 kilometers, um, which will be relevant later on. <laughs> um, so, ORCID is an open source uh, splay flight dynamics library which is implemented using uh, Java as a Maven project, and as such can be used uh, on Windows, Mac, Linux, and in theory even your phone. Um, uh, and is widely used across the space industry to do mission analysis, studies, and is also used in some operational systems. Um, it provides several low-level features, such as frames conversions, time, epoch uh, conversions from, so for example, Julian date to UTC. And, um, but its major benefit is that it has a orbit determination system, which allows us to carry out orbit determinations using data. So orbit determinations are carried out using uh, measurements, such as the azimuth and the elevation of a satellite, and then they are inputted into an algorithm which estimates the orbit parameters at a given time. The, to improve the estimate, it is important to use um, more observations and more accurate observations. So, for example, you want to have uh, multiple passes per orbit or multiple stations and with less noise. Um, so, um, an estimated orbit can then be used to predict both past and present, no, sorry, past and future positions of the object but uh, as one gets further away from the estimated pe time period, the, um, the, the estimate of the orbit gets more inaccurate as a result due to perturbations such as drag and um, 
oops, drag. <laughs> um, so to help calibrate it, you can just carry out another orbit termination using new data. So for example, the satellite catalog, which is operated by the Joint Space Command in the US, uses um, regular, regular observations of all objects to update itself, to update the, the predictions and the accuracy of all the data. In ORCID, the orbit termination is implemented using a batch least squares method. So you provide a measurement and an initial guess, which could be uh, a two-line element or the Cartesian parameters at a particular time. And then it uses the batch least squared methods to fit the observations to its guess. Oops, I've in the microphone, have I? <laughs> so um, two-line elements are encode orbital elements of the satellites and objects. Uh, and were initially intended for use with punch cards and punchline coding, but in more recent decades have been converted to use text files and are currently uploaded online. Um, they're provided by the US Air Force, which tracks all detectable objects and creates the, uh, the TLEs for us, which we can then download and use. So, um, Using a TLE and appropriate equations, you can calculate past and present, past and future positions of the orbit, but they have an issue in that it's a simplified model uh, that dates from the 1960s, uh, which ignores perturbations and forces that act outside of the sim very, very simple model. And as such, if you, you need to reintroduce these orbital perturbations um, and variations in the same way as they were removed, because if you don't, you get a really inaccurate estimate. Uh, so, as the complexity of CubeSat missions is getting bigger and bigger, and the teams are usually quite small, we need to have more accurate uh, orbit termination that is available uh, using open source, um, open source resources. So, uh, that's where ORCIT comes in with its orbit termination. So with a more accurate estimate, we can carry out station keeping and uh, Earth observation and stuff like that more, ac more easily. Um, so the level zero aim of this project was to determine whether or not it was feasible to use SAPNOGS and ORCID to carry out these orbit terminations, uh, as this would be allow this to be well, carried out. The level one aim was to achieve kilometer level accuracy as this would allow for um, easier telecommands to be sent up, easier than previously, as uh, we now know where the satellite would be, so we can track it easier, and therefore have longer uplinks. And then the level two aim was to achieve uh, 100 meter level accuracies in the orbit terminations, uh, as this would allow for mission maintenance, such as station keeping maneuvers, to be calculated and then carried out using the data. Um, so. A first set of data of Doppler curves was provided by CIS uh, in June, which was then, but then had to be converted as the date and times were in modified Julian date format, and the Doppler measurements were in frequency. So uh, the dates were converted using an inbuilt uh, mod, uh, modified Julian date converter to convert them to G, uh, UTC. And the uh, measurements were converted from frequency using a purpose-written uh, converter, so which took the frequency and the, dop and the, the communication frequency of the max value satellites and calculated that. So orbit terminations were then carried out to test the quality of the estimates, because uh, we wanted to check if the range rate bias, the, noise, the station noise, and the drag estimates had been correctly estimated. It was found initially that there was a determined curve, as you can see in the left of the two graphs, uh, at each pass, which suggested that the range rate bias had be, been incorrectly estimated. This was found to be as a result of the limit sets in ORCID. So upon some adjustment, it was found we managed to get the range rate bias correctly um, estimated. So the residuals went down from ranging from 240 to minus 320 meters a second, to just between 40 and minus 40, which suggests that the fit is much, much better than previously. So then we went on to simulating some measurements using a measurement generator, which uh, allowed us to then carry out orbit terminations on various parameters. 
So first and foremost, we looked at the effect of using an incorrect drag coefficient in the parameter file. Oh, yeah, sorry, these are the stations we used. So we've got one in the Netherlands, one in New Zealand, one here in Athens, one in Paris, one in Glasgow, one in Kirana, and one in Toulouse. Um, so first, we took the drag parameters and adjusted them incorrectly compared to what they'd been generated with. And it was found that within a certain margin, the, uh, using an incorrect drag parameter wasn't actually that bad, as you can see here, with the difference in position between that user generation and that calculated being nearly flat for each station, between zero and 10 uh, drag coefficients. So to investigate whether or not this applied higher levels, we uh, looked at the larger range and found that it didn't really matter at short distances, but over time would break down. So then we looked at varying the noise of the system and found that at uh, the, uh, the, there, was a, there was a correlation between lower noise and more accurate estimates, but this started breaking down at below five meters a second in uh, Doppler noise. So then we used multiple stations uh, and found that using three to four stations give pretty accurate results um, with a difference in velocity of uh, only a couple, sort of half a meter per second and only a couple hundred meters of inaccuracy. Um, and then we removed some stations that were inaccurate. Um, the second set of data was provided in August uh, with another 28 Doppler curves and they were um, Met processed as previously, but uh, due to time constraints, the simulated measurements weren't created. But the residuals were plotted, and we found that the residuals would come in at under 100 meters a second, which means the orbits were pretty f accurately determined. So these are for the 15th and 16th of August. So we're talking the largest residual is about 100 meters per second, uh, 17th and 18th. And then when we put this into a table with the altitudes, we found that the, it was fairly accurate in that it had calculated for every single day, it had calculated an altitude below the period and between the aperture. So we know it's not entirely inaccurate, at least. Whether or not it's in the correct position in the orbit is a different question, but due to how it's calculated, it's probably correct. So the level zero aim of the project was achieved with the level one aim also being proved to be accurate, but the level two aim has issues that seem to stem from estimating the drag parameter, and as such, will have to be fixed at some point. Um, yeah, so we would recommend that SatNogs satellites have stations have a Doppler noise with a sigma of about five meters per second. In the case of this max value, that's two kilohertz and then three or four stations are used in combination. Okay. Thank you very much. I was actually using the back of the presentation, uh, despite all the technical... Uh, but it was super interesting, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? So what's the error range of TLEs today? Like what's, uh, what, what, were you, what, what were you hoping to improve on? The, the TLEs themselves aren't necessarily the issue. It's more about how they are implemented. And these are known to potentially be off by multiple orders of magnitude. They have been known in the past, I'm not sure how long ago that was now, but they have been known to be off by about half a geostationary orbit in position. So, being able to have more accurate estimates using Doppler curves would be very, very useful. Does that make sense? Do you have an idea or a theory why it's um, 
when you 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 said that uh, three or four stations is the the perfect number to get uh, a good the best or is the the number of stations where you get the best fit. Uh, why does it break down if you uh, use more stations? So why is the accuracy then uh, oh, well, the the, pre the fit worse? Sorry, I should have um, made that clear at the time. The for the stations, there's actually not an issue with more stations. Um, that was for the drag parameter. I might mumble that bit, so apologies. Um, the reason for three to four being the sort of ideal number is that it allows you to have less data and it takes less time computationally. So it's sort of a, a balancing act between the time required and the accuracy. Five stations is not that much more accurate than, say, four stations. It's only about 40 kilometers accuracy improvement for another 25 minutes of calculations plus a number of stations data. So sort of the time constraints and the, the balance. Does that make sense? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Noel. So if I understand right, you're going to issue your own TLEs at some point. No, uh, no. so <laughs> sorry, I should have. Yeah. Um, so the idea is to use a initial guess, which could be a TLE, and then to calculate the orbits using that. That could then be published online into an online repository in a similar way to TLE. And from that, that point on, if you keep tracking the satellite, could yeah. you? Yes. Do, do you need more TLEs in there? Uh, not in theory. As, as long as the model is updated often enough, you wouldn't need to keep updating with TLEs. Okay, so we won't need the no rod anymore or something? No, in, th in theory not. <laughs> cool, thanks. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, you said about five stations. Is yes. five stations at the same, same time or you, do you prefer the, f the five stations to be spread around the orbit of the satellite? Um, so you want to have multiple passes, preferably per station. And you want them to be geographically quite spaced out because you want to have as much data for every part orbit as possible. So, for example, I believe the uh, 39 CGB sat had five passes for these dates. Uh, the Kirana one, due to its high latitudes, had a lot more, it had sort of six or seven, whereas the station in Toulouse only had three or four. But you want to have more passes and be geographically spaced out. You mentioned about uh, the CW transmissions, right? Sorry, can you say that again? You mentioned uh, that you use CW transmissions, right? Yes. So have you used uh, your method for more wideband transmissions, like uh, FSKs? Uh? Um, unfortunately, I don't know, because I got these duplicates provided to me. Um, okay. But in theory, it should be possible to use any transmission from a satellite, as long as you know the transmission frequency. Yeah, but then the problem is to to track uh, exactly the the bandwidth and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you need. You need an, I I think that there you need uh, some kind of help from the demodulation part of uh, the station. Sorry. So then uh, I think that we should talk. Yeah, sorry, I can't quite hear you. Oh, okay. So the the, the issue is that uh, right now you use only the CW because it's very very narrow, okay, mm -hmm. and it's very easy to predict uh, the, the the frequency. Yeah. Uh, but the way, uh, as uh, the uh, the bandwidth increases, it's become more more difficult to to find out the exact uh, frequency shift. Yeah. Yeah. So if I've understood correctly, the idea then would be to use a TLE estimate of what the frequency should be to begin with and then to keep track of what you need to have to keep it uh, as it passes over. I'm not sure if that answers your question entirely. No, just for a clarification, you said that you're using CW and CW is a very narrow, yes. is a very narrow frequency yep. and Manol is asking if uh, if you use some uh, more wide uh, mm -hmm. band modulations, so maybe you need uh, information for, for, from the demodulation part 
of the station in order to, yeah. to calculate the, the Doppler shift. Yeah, you would. Um, that would probably have to require some extra additional work to implement it properly. There is a As the wider band would probably lead to uh, more noise and therefore more inaccurate okay. estimate. No. No. Oh. Ah, there's a question from the internet. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, what about non-stable onboard oscillators and other drift factors? And also, are there other providers apart from Space Track? It's from Jan. From Peoset, yes. Sorry, could you say that? So, about onboard oscillators that cause disturbances to the satellites, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, in that case, you would need to have, you need to update your per the, um, the model more often, as you'd have more perturbations and therefore would have to take more data to keep the, calib the model calibrated. And then there was a second part to that question. Um, there is the NORAD catalog itself, which you can find, but the Space Track one has got the best UI setup. The other one is a website from the 90s in terms of how it's laid out. It's a bit of a pain to find your way through. 